Okay, we are all recording and we're back here for more fun stuff with stochastic processes. Stochastic is a fancy word for random. So if you want to just talk to me, we talk about random or stochastics. But if you want to um, impress your friends and neighbors, what you do is you say stochastic, because that's a big word. See, stochastic has three syllables and random only has two syllables. And therefore, stochastic is more impressive <laughs> than, than random. Let's, uh, you know, what I'd like to do is kind of uh, pause here and maybe work some of the problems that we were assigned both in the last homework and in the in the examination. And uh, hopefully, if you could get ready your examination, we'll kind of call on people randomly and see what you've done in terms of the in, in terms of the uh, in terms of the examination. So let me share my screen here. Okay, uh, this I think was a, uh, the, the, first, the, the first problem, Tammy is hosting the annual Men with Exactly Two Kids Club convention next week where fathers come with their two children to spend a week together doing activities and bonding with their kids. Tammy needs to choose a father to hand out towels in the men's shower and wants to engage a man who has two sons for the task. Notice we're, well, I won't even mention that, never mind. If, if we know uh, that one of the two children of the man is male, what's the chance the father uh, at the convention has two male children? So we're given that one is male. What's the probability that both are male? Can somebody just give me the answer here, which was kind of surprising? At, uh, 33%, if I remember correctly. I'm still trying to pull it up, but I got 33%. Um, no, I think it was on the other, on the other hand, I think it was something else. Anybody get a different result? I also had 33. Okay. Hey, I had 50%. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let, let me work it out and let me see, let, let me see what we get. And you tell me. We're were we asking about A or B in this question? I'm sorry. Um, let's see, A. Okay. Yeah, A, where did A go? Yeah, if we know one of the children is male. So uh, applying the same sort of uh, mathematics that we did for, um, let's see, am I sharing my screen? I don't want to share no, my screen. the whiteboard. Okay, I'm going to share my whiteboard. Always share your whiteboard. Yeah, it turns out that um, that what what you have when you start is that if a person has two kids, they can be male male. They can be uh, male male female. They can be. Uh, let's see male, female. In other words, this one is the, the, the first one is the oldest, and then they can have two females, right? Or two males, I'm sorry, two males. So we have how many? We have four different possibilities here. We have four different possibilities. Now, we know that this is not true. The kid cannot have cannot have uh two two whoops i did the wrong ones i'm getting my males and females they cannot have two females right and so this is the field that we're working with and each one of these is equally probable and uh, you're right you're right it is one third right because having two males, here we have one male, here we have another male, and here we have two males. What is confusing on this problem typically is that people assume he has two kids and the youngest is a male or the oldest is a male. If you said the youngest was a male or the oldest was a male, all of a sudden things increase. What if the oldest was a male? First of all, let's let's give the example that one third is the uh, chance of having of having two. If the oldest was a male, mm -hmm. 
and it would be 50 percent if the oldest was a male yes it would be 50 percent right so many times people hear that one was a male and um so that they, they assume it's the oldest but yeah if the oldest is a male it could be this one or this one let's see it could be this one well that's the youngest okay it could be this one or this one, right? So what's the chances there? The oldest is a male. This is the young and the old, young and the old, young and the old. So the oldest is male gives us this, this result and this result. So therefore it's only 50%. You've eliminated, you've also eliminated this. So it's 50%. Okay. So it looks like most of you, most of you got that one, right? Which is really good. Let's go back to the, uh, Let's go back to the problem. And this one is more complicated. And I'm going to call on somebody to do this. Oop, what's this? Okay, you're not supposed to see that. How'd that get up there? Okay. Okay, uh, in addition to A, we also know that a son was born in an even year. Uh, it, in other words, 2016, 2018, 2020. What is the chance a father at the convention has two male children? And a son means either either son if the father has two sons. How many work this one out and, and feel comfortable about it? Okay, Jess. Okay, good, good. I think everybody did. Let's, uh, let me, uh, uh, Justin, you're zero. Adam is one. Glauco is two. Theo is three. And Matthew is four. So let's uh, work this out. So I got... Um, Gosh, I got, a, I got a coin that I can't tell the difference between the tails and the heads. So let me, uh, let me do something else. Today is all dimes day. I'm using three American dimes, okay? Three American dimes. And these are fair and they're all, no, I'm not using three. What is this one? Oh my goodness. I think this one is either... I don't know. I think it might be Korean. Anybody recognize this? Anybody know Korean? I don't know if you can see it close enough. It's probably too blurred. Okay. I think it's Korean coin. I've been everywhere. And I always bring home coinage. Okay. So we have a one, zero, zero. Okay. Matthew, you're up. Okay. Do you feel comfortable presenting it? First of all, Moderately. Okay. Okay. Moderately. Okay. Let's see your moderate. A while. What, what, what was your final answer? Let's just ask what the final answer oh, yeah. is and, and vote on it. Yeah. Uh, 41.86%. Okay. So the probability increases. Uh, how many agree with that result? What is it in terms of a fraction? Do you know? I do not. I don't have you, that you, one. You didn't save that? Okay. Well, how I got, many? I got something very close to that, but I got 42.86, which was three sevenths. Okay. I also got close, but I got 42.9. <laughs> I got 42. I did some rounding, so. Okay. Now, here, here's the question. It, it sounds like you guys used a Monte Carlo sort of simulation that you might have written a little program and um and had it generate how many did that that's a fine that's a fine way to do it nobody did that they did it analytically okay what did you do it analytically matthew yep okay let's go ahead and and see what you've done and i will stop sharing and i will give you permission to share your screen So I just said that the chance of sun for the case of two boys is uh, there's one born in an even year was 75%. So then I multiplied that by the 33% from the previous Ooh. 25. Okay. And then I did the same thing for the girl boy situation. So it was 50% chance born in even year. And so then that ends up being 33%. And then I just did, um, 
33 over 25, just did those little equations, solve for x to get 41.86. Okay. Um, did anybody did anybody do it the um, a, a similar a similar way that Matthew did it? Did anybody do it in a different way? <laughs> Everybody did it in a different way. Okay, let's see. Well, you, you got you, you got a very interesting answer, and it agreed uh, with these other ones. You know, I don't I don't have the intelligence of the sharpness right now to tell the degree to which you're right and wrong. So let's let's look at another one. Uh, two, who is two? I think that's. Uh, Who's two? Okay, Glauco. Oh, sorry, it's me. Yeah. Okay. Share screen. Okay, my answer is here. I have all the probabilities for two daughters. This one fourth, one daughter. This is the youngest, um, and this is the oldest. Okay, so, so you you did you did. This is the way I would have done it. I would have made a an exhaustive table of all possibilities. Yes, so the possibilities marked with a cross are the possibilities that a father has at least one son that was born in an even year. And the one marked with the triangle are the intersection between having two sons and, are, and at least one of them born in an even year. So then I do the quotient the fraction, the fraction, and I get a very close solution as Matthew, but it's slightly different. Okay, so, um, okay, can't you just go down to your table and say uh, one, two, three, yes. and count them? I have. Um, okay. Uh, that uh, Dota and Dota, the probability is 0.25. Probability of the youngest is a, a girl and the oldest is a son. Uh, oh, I see what you've done. Okay, I see yeah. what you've done. Okay. I, I split it all with two doctors. It's 0 0.5, 25. Okay. One daughter and one son, even or, or odd, is half of it. Yes. And then two sons is half or, or of half of it. So this all adds to <laughs> <Okay>. one. <laughs> This column. Adds okay, to got one. it. So, so your list, your list was not exhaustive, but uh, I think that might. Uh, I don't it's, know. That might be at okay. Least, at least is a uh, granular to the point of the categories that I care about. Okay. As having one song, born in an even year. That's interesting. That you got. Uh, let's see. What was Matthew's result? It looks like one. I just wrote it down wrong because I just redid the calculation. And I got forty-two point eight six. Okay, well they're ballpark. This is interesting, but these are different different results, and we should all get the same result. Did anybody do an exhaustive table? I think I did an exhaustive table. Okay, let's see. Uh, two people did an exhaustive table. Hold your hands up again, uh, Justin and Adam. Let me flip a coin. Justin, your heads. Okay, it's tails. Adam, what do you got? So yeah, I made the, the exhaustive table here. Um, all the ones that are highlighted have at least one male, even child. And then the green ones are the ones that have both male children. So then there are seven possibilities where you have one male even child and three of them have two male children. So the probability is three sevenths, 42.9. Okay, so the seventh is all of the cells that are colored, the, the yellow and the green. Yes. And then the, the, the successes are the green. Yes. Okay, see, this is the way I would have done it. And this was more, more closely related to the way that um, uh, Pascal and Fermat solve the unsolved problem, if you remember. Yeah, it's the same way I did the first yeah, one. Yeah, and it's the same way, same way that you did the first one. So I would say that this is the this is the correct result because it's an exhaustive partition of all outcomes. We apply Bernoulli's principle of insufficient reason. All of these are equally probable. 
Uh, all of the colored ones are equally probable. So there's seven outcomes that are equally probable. And of those three are successful. Now, the inter so I, I would say that 42.9% is the correct answer, three over seven, whatever three over seven is. So if you didn't get that exactly, you, you have a, a flaw <laughs> in your solution. But this is, uh, yeah, this is, this is the way to do it. It goes back to fundamentals and, and covers all bases, doesn't it? Covers all bases. Mm -hmm. so, okay, very, very nice. Um, three out of seven. You know, and I still look at this problem. I still look at this problem and I think, good grief. The kid's born on an even year. What information could that tell you? It doesn't make, does it make sense to anybody? Does anybody tie their intuition to this result? Because it's, to me, not a very- I, I did, I actually did, but I forgot how. <laughs> I can try and remember if you want me. <laughs> uh, okay, you think about it, and if it comes up, let me know. Okay. 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 I will. Because I think that that was uh, that was a, that was interesting. Okay. Yeah, was like, does does ahead. this actually work? Yes, like, it does. I mean, that's that's the astonishing part about it. So I should plan the the birth years of my children to so figure out the genders. <laughs> I guess, I guess, if you come up against this, uh, against this chance. So, yeah, it's weird. It's kind of interesting. My two, my two boys were both born on the same day, two years apart. Mm -hmm. And my daughter was March 2nd, and we just about had the third one on March 2nd, but it was delayed, and she was March 7th, my, my daughter. Mm -hmm. So we were really excited that we might have three kids born on the same day. But we looked in the Guinness Book of World Records, and I think there was somebody that had like seven kids born on the same day. But, you know, I think they cheated. I think they went in and they said, doctor, we got this record going. Could you induce labor? I, I suspect that that sort of thing was going on in the background. So, yeah, all sorts of weird probabilities uh, happen. And many times the probabilities fly in the face of, of just total. I can Go ahead. I can I can try and explain it to to you all. Uh, if you if I can share my screen. Okay. Okay. So here in this table, when you say that the one of the sons was born in an even year, uh, you are uh, discarding this option that you have one daughter and one son born in an odd year. And the probability is 10125. And you're also discarding this um, this option that you have two sons born in an odd year. So the chances that you are discarding for uh, two sons are lower than the chances you are discarding for uh, one daughter and one son. So, yeah. It, so, it in other words, what, what 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 it does is it removes, um, yeah, it, re, it, re, it removes other chances. You know, there, uh, John Maynard Keynes, who was famous for Keynesian economics, was not a big fan of Bernoulli's principle, and he gave. This is not his example, but here here I think is uh, another example which explains Keynes' position. You want to flip two coins, and uh, what is Bernoulli's principle of insufficient reason? It says that you have you assign equal probability to the outcomes if you know nothing about the problem that you're talking about. All possibilities have equal outcomes. So if you roll a die, the chances of getting three pips on the die are one in six. But imagine you flip two coins. Now, if you look at heads, 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 tails, tails, heads, tails, tails, the probability, the probability of getting um, two heads is one out of four, right? But imagine you're really stupid and you really know nothing about what's going on. You know nothing about the background probability and you say, okay, look, I'm either going to get two heads or I'm not going to get two heads. So those are the two outcomes. So if 
you say, I get two heads. I don't get two heads. Okay, well, the chance of me getting two heads is a half. Do you see that discrepancy? So that's the reason we have to go to an exhaustive partition of the outcomes. And I think the exhaustive partition gives you the, the true answer. But I believe that you have you have naive applications of Bernoulli's principle. For example, in the social sciences, you can talk about differentiation between stupid kids and smart kids, okay? So what's the chance of your kid, if you know nothing, what's the chance of a kid being smart? One half, right? But what if you say, okay, smart kids, stupid kids, and kids in the middle, so you had a third category. What's the probability of stupid kids now? It's one third. Well, clearly that they, they, they both can't be right. So one has to be very careful in the application of Bernoulli's principle. In some cases, such as the problems we've worked here, the application is just straightforwardly clear. There's no ambiguity in what we do. But I think that if we apply it in soft cases, such as the social sciences or other places, um, such as really stupid people saying, well, you know, I get two results, I get two heads, or I don't get two heads. One has to be very careful. So there are misapplications of it. Interesting, huh? Okay, so Glauco has pointed out by putting the even year, you cancel out, uh, you cancel out other possibilities, which is kind of interesting. Okay, let's go to, um, let's go to the next one. Uh, find a nonlinearity y to transform an exponential uh, e to the e to the minus x to a Cauchy, where c is a constant. For this one, I would first of all like just an explanation of the approach that you used. An explanation of the approach that you used. And I just dropped my dime. Okay. I have picked up my dime. So let's see who the lucky winner is here. The lucky winner is one. Who is one? Okay, Adam. All right, so yeah, the uh, the approach I used, I took the uh, the exponential, I turned it into uniform, and I took the uniform, turned it into Cauchy. Exactly. Then I did that's, that in one step. <laughs> that's yeah, that and then combine the two. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's exactly the way that I would do it. Oh my goodness, did you use a Word on this or was this LaTeX? This is Word. I, I did wood because I'm faster with wood right now. <laughs> okay, okay. So kind of step us through what you did here. Right, so we have our, we have f of x here being the exponential. I defined f of z to be the uniform distribution and f of y being the, the Cauchy distribution we're looking for here. So then first part here, we take f of, or we do kind of the same transform setup we've been doing a lot. So f of z, or the, the cumulative distribution of z, so probability of z is less than a z, probability of the transfer function less than z, uh, transforming it to x, and then you do x is less than or equal to g inverse f of g inverse of z. Okay, so and that's then, the yeah. standard deriv derivation. Yeah, so we skip to the right. bottom that you're so you nonlinear. Okay, one, one minus d1. Yeah, one minus e to the minus x. Then you start from the uniform and you want to transform it into the Cauchy, do the same sort of thing. Uh, follows the same derivation almost exactly, but then you get the second function is the tangent of one over C Y minus one half, uh, which is the inverse of the cumulative distribution function. Um, and then you combine them together doing G2 of G1 of X. So you get the tangent of one over C of one half minus E to the minus X. You know, that's fascinating because you get a function of a function. We're typically not we we don't get deep enough into the mathematics to typically look at functions of functions, but that's indeed what we have here, mm -hmm. which is which is very interesting. And Did I anybody? I, okay, go ahead. I plotted it too, and it worked out. <laughs> All right. Oh wow. Okay. All stages of the transformation. Okay. So yeah, it started with this exponential, and the orange lines are the uh, the, the plot of as we expect the distribution, and then the histograms are with random data. Um, so yeah, the starting exponential, the mid-step uniform, and the final coach. Okay. Boy, that's very nice. Very, very cute. And you attacked it the same way that I did. Did anybody attack it a different way that they would like to share? Okay. 
Uh, did the rest of you kind of attack it the same way? Okay, Glauco, yeah, yeah, sh Glauco shaking his head. Okay, Theo's good. Justin, okay. Yeah, whenever I started this problem, I was like, hmm, how are we going to go about this? And then I finally made the realization, oh, we can go to uniform. Yeah, it is one of, those, like... it's one of those aha moments. Yeah, I had an aha. Yeah. Yes, yes. You know, this is very interesting. Um, Roger Penrose. How many know Roger Penrose? He just won the Nobel Prize. And do you know what he won the Nobel Prize for? He published the first whole about first paper. Of, I believe he got it for this for um, predicting black holes with Stephen Hawking. He was a contemporary of Stephen Hawking. Hawking didn't win the Nobel Prize because I think you have to be alive to win the Nobel Prize. So it was awarded to Roger Penrose. But he wrote a book which was called The Emperor's New Mind. And in the book, he makes the case that artificial intelligence will never reach the pinnacle of what humans can do, which is something that, uh, that I believe, and I believe there's ample evidence for that. Um, my, oh, yeah, so he, he was talking about what people do that computers, or, I'm sorry, what, can, what people can do that sparks creativity. And he goes back and he says, there are there is something called a flash of genius. And Justin, you had a little flash of genius when it just, and these are ideas which just pop into your head and you go, where did they come from? Because many times, you know, things don't relate. Uh, you know, it, it, the problems that I gave for the, uh, for, for the exam were not straightforward applications of what you learned in class. They were, they were extensions of that to make you think a little bit. But where does this come from? He talked about people like Tesla. Tesla was walking along the beach famously. This was in his autobiography. And he had this idea. I got the brushless motor. I got the linear induction machine. I know how to make a motor without brushes. And famously, he said he smoothed out the dirt where he was walking or the sand. I forget if it was on the beach or on a trail. And he kind of sketched out the, um, the idea for the brushless motor, which is the motor that we all use today. So it was a, a, a flash of genius. And there are other people that have had flashes of genius. One was Gauss. He said, you know, I've been thinking about this problem and I just had this insight, it was boom, and it came out of nowhere. And for Gauss, and this is this is true genius, where these flashes of genius are totally separated from what has been done before and are totally new insights. And I'm sure that each of you have experienced these little flashes of genius that happen, these, these instantaneous, um, instantaneous um, uh, uh, influx of creativity. Uh, interestingly, these flashes of genius also come from people in the music industry. Uh, Paul McCartney, how many, how many know who Paul McCartney is? Is it, we, we getting too old? Everybody knows. Okay, he was the Beatle guy. He woke up this mor one morning, this morning, he woke up one morning and he had this tune running through his head. And he says, you know, I've heard this tune before, but he went to the piano, he kind of worked out the chords and he wrote down the music and he didn't have a name for it. So he called it scrambled eggs. And he went around and he played this clip for some for different people because he says, I'm sure I am sure that um, I had heard this tune from somewhere before it was so it was so familiar. It was so beautiful. And he shopped it around. Then he finally decided I'm going to act like a guy that finds a wallet full of money. I'm going to turn it into the cops. And if nobody claims it in a month, I'm going to claim it for myself. So after shopping it around for a while, he, um, he claimed it for himself and they wrote lyrics for it. And do you, do you know what the song was? Anybody have a guess? I don't know if you've ever heard of the, of the song yesterday, one of the Beatles most covered songs people. In fact, I think for a while it was the most covered songs. In other words, more artists did, yesterday than any other and this was totally just a flash of genius in the area of the creative arts and there's other ones that i would talk about if i had time because this this fascinates me people like hoagie carmichael bob dylan talks about these flashes of genius uh do you guys know who um 
Tom Petty is. Okay, a couple of shakes of head. He was head of a band called the uh, Tom Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, I think. And he was with a super group called the Traveling Wilburys. And he says, you know, I don't know where these songs come from. And he says, I'm really afraid to examine it too closely because I'm afraid that if I examine it too closely, the whole thing will disappear, which I think was very interesting. So you guys as being intellectually gifted in the area of mathematics and engineering will have these flashes of genius. And I maintain that they are totally incapable of being done by a machine. A machine cannot have a flash of genius. It cannot, it cannot go through that creative process. And if you doubt me, read Roger Penrose's book, um, The Emperor's New Mind, and he will convince you. He will convince you. Okay. That was an interesting rabbit trail, huh? Uh, let, uh, okay, this is, this is the interesting one. Uh, how many got this, you think? One. Two. Okay, I'm going to show you the answer because I actually worked it out because I had a hard time working it out. I'm going to go and try to get Google Docs. I believe I did it in Google Docs. Yeah, let me. Uh... Let me go to Google Docs here. I don't want to do something. <laughs> the magic quadrant. Speaking of magic quadrant, I was reading the other day what the greatest mathematician of all time, Leonard Euler, did, some of the things he did. And uh, one of the things he did is come up with the Latin cube and see if you guys can do that. I'm not going to assign it as a homework, but Euler was the first to figure it out. Take a 10 by 10 matrix and fill it in with numbers from zero to nine so that... Uh, no column or no row has duplicate numbers in them. And so that was the like a 3D Sudoku puzzle. <laughs> in fact, it was the genesis of Sudoku. Sudoku. I read this in an article in Uncle John's Bathroom Reader about the formation of Sudoku. And uh, it started with Euler's Latin Square. And it's it um, it eventually evolved in Sudoku, or how do you say it? Sudoku, Sudoku. I say Sudoku. I have no idea. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Here we go. You remember this Earth conversion? I'll put a link to this on, on the site. But remember, we did the Earth condition, and we did one Earth to the other Earth. I worked out this problem that I gave you. Uh, I worked out this problem and I got a result and I want to see if anybody got the result that I got. I hope you did. I think I'm almost certain I'm right, but I got that the density function was equal to this funny thing here. C log yeah, Z. I got that too. Did you get that? Who else got it? I got that, but with a, maybe with a different, I don't know. No. Yeah. I got the same thing. Yes. You got the same thing. Okay. Okay. Oh, I thought that was a fun problem. I hope you, you enjoyed it as much as I, I hope you enjoyed doing the problem as much as I enjoyed assigning it. <laughs> okay. So, okay. So that, that is, that is good. And what's interesting about this is you had to go through some math. People are not, not too much into raising numbers to one over X powers, but you know, it worked out. Uh, the math worked out very, very nicely. Once you figured out what the heck was going on. So I got the same solution as well. You Just did to find it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Did it take you long to figure out what was going on? It took me a little bit of while to figure out what was going on and that, uh, and the, for example, I guess the one of these had to be less than one and for the other one, it didn't matter. So yeah, it was, um, and how many use Wolfram Alpha or the uh, computer, the, 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 the online integral solver? Okay. Every, okay, everybody did. Okay. So good for you. So you did it exactly the way that I do it. That's the purpose of the class, that you do everything uh, exactly the same as I do. So, 
but it was it was difficult for me to figure out that I had to start at zero and not minus infinity. So I got some troubles there because I was integrating from minus infinity to infinity, but then I yes. realized, oh no, it has to be from zero. So everything it, works it is. suddenly. Yeah, see, this is the thing, and we're not used to thinking about this. If you have X between zero and one, and you have um, Y between zero and one, Y to the one over X also goes between zero and one. And that was the that was the weird I think the weird uh, weird result of this. Okay, let's uh, let's go on. Uh, anybody find an example of an equality for the Markov process? Let's first of all use the Markov process. Okay, let's see. Shaking it up here, I got four. No, we did four already. You know what? Since we have four, I can just flip two coins, right? Okay, uh, three. Who's three? That would be me. Okay, go for it. I, I will. I, okay. I will stop the sharing. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Sharing. Okay. I think yeah, I could, should see. could you make it a little bit bigger? Um, yeah. You know oh what? boy, maybe, it's off screen. Okay, should, we'll work that should, way. Uh, I'll. Uh, I'll change my screens around for the next time. Um, so the density function that I chose is f of x uh, is equal to the uh, the delta of x minus a. So this is basically your whole probability density function exists at one point. Um, uh, and then uh, the probability that x bar is greater than or equal to a uh, equals bar x over a because both sides of this evaluate to one that is really cool that's uh, that's a um a chevy chef inequality that is always an equality yes and it's kind of cheating because well we we did talk about how we could use delta functions as probability density functions but uh, without that, it certainly would not work. Yeah, this is this. Yeah, no, it's a probability density function. For example, what's the probability that we have six people on this Zoom call? That that would be one, right? And so it would be characterized as a single Dirac delta located at uh, the number of people in the room equal to six. So it's a probability density function for a deterministic output when there's no randomness actually. Okay. Well, you're doing so good, Theo. Let's go on to the other one. Okay. Um, okay. So it looks like this one we consider we're using a Gaussian with a standard deviation of one and a mean of zero. Uh, and then we let A, which is the point that we're evaluating, <laughs> okay. the yet, go off to infinity. So then the probability of the absolute value of the random variable minus the mean being greater than a is equal to zero. Uh, and then the variance of our of our Gaussian, uh, we said was. Uh, OK, that's that's an interesting one. This is one which uh, works in the limit and I, is a totally acceptable answer. Did anybody get anything that did not require infinities? Okay, I only see one hand raise. Oh, oh two hand raise. Okay. So let's see. I think last time we flipped two one. I think Adam won. So let's go to Glauco. I have, let me find it. Yeah. <laughs> let's go. <laughs> I was reading that through. What, though, the shadows of the mind? And the the Emperor's New Mind is his first book. That's the one that really, really made a big impact on uh, me. Yeah, I have I have the Emperor's here. I oh, okay. it. Yeah. Read it with a pencil and paper, though. Penrose is not hesitant to get into the math deeply. Okay, go ahead. I have this distribution that uh, it's uh, two points. Uh, I would call that a, a binomial distribution. 50 chance of getting okay. a plus or minus one. Okay. 
Okay, so the variance is uh, one and the mean is zero. And uh, um, the, yeah, it's always equal. If, if A is, um, well, I'm, I'm blank now. <laughs> I have to prove that uh, the probability that the, the value minus the mean is greater or equal than A is less or equal than the variance uh, divided by A squared. So the variance divided by A squared is, um, is always one and the probability of the number of the absolute value being greater or equal that a is one two so it's okay equal. so this this is an example of a when equality is met for a specific instance right uh, it's not true for the whole probability density function uh, it's because you assume yeah, no, only, you, only for the values on yeah, the distribution. Yes, yes. Only oh. for the values of the distribution. Okay, good, good. Very good. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Glauco. Anybody else have, an, have another example they'd like to share? This doesn't have a single example. Adam, was yours really different or about the same? Would we be uh, illuminated? Similar to Glauco's, but it has uh, minus one, zero, and one in it. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, so very, very similar. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, great, guys. You're doing really fantastic. Thank you. Okay, uh, this one, this number five is probably a problem that you can find online or any statistics book. So I'm hoping that you found that if you were having problems with the mathematics. Did anybody have a problem with this at all? Uh, should we go through it or not? Okay, I don't hear excitement on either realm. Here's the thing, when, you, when you're given uh, statistics for engineering sort of classes, you use things like the chi-squared distribution, but you're never really explained what the chi-squared is, where it came from, and this is where it comes from. So now you can actually generate generate the chi-squared. And usually, at least when I took when I took the course in like engineering statistics, chi-squared was a lookup table. I'm sure now that it can be generated in a MATLAB or in an Excel. Uh, spreadsheet. I'm sure that there's there's functions for the chi squared, but you never really had an intuitive understanding. At least I didn't of what the chi squared was until I took a a problem that uh, until I looked at a problem which was palatable, uh, and I was able to work through the mathematics. Then I had a little light bulb go on and say, Ah, that's where all of this stuff comes from. Okay, let's uh, let's do this. I I am interested in seeing this computer work. So if you don't have it up, go ahead and uh, get it up here. And let's talk about uh, generating a bunch of empirical EDFs. And I wanted you to just use a random number generator between zero and one to do one of them. Okay, then I wanted yeah. you to. I wanted you to convolve them and kind of illustrate the central limit theorem. Uh, so let me let me choose. I think has everybody had a chance to go yet? Have we hit just? I, yeah. Okay. Yeah. With what's that? Yeah, I don't think I've gone yet. Then okay. Also, I think our first problem was the one above it. Oh. Right. You're right. You're right. Okay. Sorry about that. So let's do that one. <laughs> Uh, I skip. I skip this one. Randomly generate points in the square. Inside the square is an inscribed circle, and what is the probability a point will be in the circle? And uh, as each new point is added, I just wanted to show you the law of large numbers from kind of a weird situation. Now, this you could do, as we talked about in class, by throwing darts. Right? If you had a bunch of circles in a rectangular grid and they were all touching each other and you threw a dart, the probability that you would be inside a circle would be the probability that your 
that you're inside the circle that you're doing here. So this really illustrates that you can estimate pi using the law of large numbers, throwing darts, which I always found as fascinating. So with that, uh, Justin, go ahead and, uh, and do it. All right. Yeah, so um, for this one, you know, it's it's working off the law of large numbers and- Oh, is this the one you told me you had a, a, a movie of? Yes. All right, okay, good. Um, yes, I guess I can. So this is like, this is the law of, the strong law of large numbers and it's right. like the limit as the samples go to infinity, you're gonna, your sampled average is approaches the true average and- Well, don't say the true average, say the mean or I think mean. I would, th that is at least for this class. I think as you go from class to class, you might hear it as something different, but I prefer to okay. refer to it as the mean because the mean is a specific number. The average is a random variable. Okay, go ahead. Okay, yeah. So then for this example, I um, we have two uniform distributions, which is the unit square, and we have a circle inscribed inside the square. And um, I had calculated that probability value, which is just kind of like the based on the, the area, percentage of the area that the circle covers, which turned out to be 78.54%. And I plotted random values inside this unit square and took note of whether they fell inside or outside the, the circle, and then plotted the probability as it converged on the right. So let me take my video. And then, so you can see the plot, the X's are just random points that are placed inside the distribution. And then we can see as, the number of iterations it continues, the, it gets closer and closer to that blue line, which is the final convergence point. So it's kind of like showing you how the law of large numbers is. You get a large number of samples, you're getting closer and closer to that um, mean of, of the distribution you're looking at. That's really interesting because it looks like you are always, uh, you reach a point where you're always overestimating. And that's that's well, fascinating. You can, see, you can see towards the end of the video, like the amount that we're going over the line decreases. As decreases, time goes on. yes. So you can see at the end of the video, it's coming back down, and then it goes back up, and it comes back down again. Like right here, it's like it's right like on the line now. And if if I continue to carry it out, it would eventually just be sitting right on that blue line. Yes, of course. There's a um, there's an old saying that right you hear people, educated people use. Yeah, keep it going. I think it's just fun to watch. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how many did you do all together before, uh, before you stopped? This was 750. 750. That's kind of cool. There, there's a phrase called reversion to the mean. Have anybody heard of this phrase before? It says that many times in statistics, there's an underlying truth. In this, in this case, the underlying truth was pi over four, okay? Mm -hmm. And that no matter what happened, you would revert towards the mean. So if this is a stock price, for example, I'm going to ask you to freeze it when I say stop, okay? Let's see. Uh, yeah, when, yeah, go ahead and stop that if there's an underlying truth, can you see my cursor here? No, I don't think we can. Okay, you can't see my okay. cursor. But do you see where it goes? It goes above the, the mean. Mm -hmm. Okay, if there's an underlying truth, uh, uh, what did I say, reversion to the mean or, mm -hmm. or something like that, means yeah. that it's overpriced and eventually that stock or whatever will revert back down and it will go down to that level. So I guess if you have a stock where you're below your mean, which is like the underlying truth of the stock, then you'd want to invest. You'd want to invest, right. Up. But of course, determining that mean is an art and a guess. But you still hear people you're using the, the you're predicting the future, but you still hear people talking about uh, reverting to the mean. And that's what's going to happen with the law of large numbers, that eventually this thing is above what your target is. So there you go. We go a little bit further, and you can see it gets closer to the target. Mm -hmm. And so that's the concept of reversion to the mean. But this illustrates, again, the law of large numbers, I think, in a very interesting way and will allow you to generate pi over four uh, to any degree of accuracy that you like. Uh, if if you use if you use uh, computers, 
very, very much different than historical pie. There is a great book called The History of Pie. It, in fact, it was the first book somebody bought for me off of Amazon.com. I remember the idea that you could buy a book just on the web, just put in, just put in the book and the, and the, and give them your credit card and it'd be mailed to you. That was incredible. So he bought me the, uh, the history of pie, but it, but it looks through the history of pie and how it's gotten more and more accurate and how people have uh, uh, traced the advancement of technology and society by the accuracy of pie. That was basically the idea. I heard somewhere that the Greeks used to think that pi was the square root of 10. Think about that. Yeah, kind of, right? It, it, yeah, it's close. It's pretty close. So, uh, and do you know one of the first historical estimates of pi is in Scripture, where they were going to build a tabernacle, and it was supposed to be round, and the Scripture says something like, build it uh, three times— build it so that it is three times in circumference what it is in diameter. So that gives an estimate of pi to one significant figure. And that's somewhere in the Bible. And I've heard people, this is, this is terrible. They say, well, you know, if you'd have taken into account the thickness of the walls, it would be three instead of 3.14159. That's total speculation. But I think it's interesting that historically one of the, one of the first estimates of pi is in, in the Bible. Okay, thank you, Justin. I, th I don't know if anybody can do better than that. Anybody else want to share what they did? It's kind of, kind of very interesting. Okay, so let's... I did more points, but I don't have a fancy video. <laughs> uh, okay, how close did you get, Adam? I, I, got, I got there. <laughs> you got there? Uh, and as far as my graph, you can see, I, yeah. It's all, the lines are on top of each other. <laughs> okay, so the word for that, if you're writing a paper, is graphically indistinguishable. Yes, yeah. I, I, went, I did 10 to the eighth points. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, show us, show us your graph. That would be kind of cool. Yeah, I wanted to go out to more points, but with making the video and plotting, it, it made it take longer to do. Sure. That. Okay. No, that, that, no, that's great, Justin. Your 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 video is just fine. Who said that? I thought it was Justin. That was Justin. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, no, I I think what you did is perfect. Now this is interesting too because Adam's part went. Excuse me. Adam's uh, plot went positive too, and then reverted back to the mean. I would expect uh, sometimes that there would be kind of an oscillatory nature. You would overshoot and undershoot, and uh, kind of like a kind of like a damp sinusoid. But no, yeah, it looks have... really close. To oh here. yeah, there it pops. There pops over and under, right? Yeah, but then it it just goes right under the line. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Interestingly enough, mine also overshot way above the true value, and then slowly converged in from the top. Interesting. Okay. Is the MATLAB random number generator not perfectly random? Well, here's something. I can tell you one time I was doing uh, some work with random numbers and I wrote this program. And in order to get results, it had to run like for three days. So I let the thing run for three days. I halted it and I copied, it was a Monte Carlo simulation. I copied down the results. And then I let it run for, again, I restarted the program and let it run again. And after three more days, you know what I got? I got exactly the same results. <laughs> the random number generator for MATLAB was starting with the same seed every time. I hope uh, that there is a fix to that now. Back then, though, when I was doing it, I had to go and put a random seed every time in order to reseed the random number generator so that it... Um, it did very well. Yeah, uh, I can't remember if it's default anymore or not. But yeah, you, the, the MATLAB random number generator is a list. So yeah, you can start at the same point every time. <laughs> yeah, which isn't very good. Which isn't very good. Let me ask you this question. Suppose you want to generate random numbers between uh, 0 and 9. Could you take the number pi and choose a number, a really, really big number, go out to the billionth decimal place and start there and look at those numbers coming off of pi and consider them as being random. Or 
or for well, that matter, for that matter, the square root of two or E. Though not random, but they're probably random enough. <laughs> That's right. One of the things that we have to remember, and I think I mentioned this in the first lecture or two, is that randomness is simply a model. And we use the model because it works and it works so very well. And the theory has just exploded in terms of, in terms of contribution. So it's a very, very useful theory. And number two, there's different definitions of randomness. I believe that I mentioned that for um, casino, when casinos come in and get, the, get their one-armed bandits checked for randomness, they have to pass a slew of tests referred to the diehard battery of tests. And this is interesting because battery is a... Well, it means a list of tests, but also diehard battery is also the battery that used to be sold by Sears and Roebuck, diehard batteries. And they came with great, uh, great warranties and stuff. So it's the diehard battery of tests. Because um, somebody, Glauco, you, you've used the diehard battery of tests. Could you put the, uh, the, the screen up for the diehard battery of tests, maybe in Wikipedia or something? Oh, yes. And there is, there is software, isn't that correct, uh, Glauco, that, that, that lets you test whether, oh, no, you got Die Hard the movie. Oh, uh, <laughs> yes, there, there is a Linux package called Die Harder that lets you run it against some file with numbers or with some string of, of bits. Um, Okay, there we go. So there's a whole bunch of different tests that these diehard has to uh, has to has to look at before it's considered random. And uh, yeah, sorry, I, I I want to say something. Um, if you have a, some some random number generator or some list that passes all the battery of tests, that's not random because it's supposed to fail some of them. So that's interesting too. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so all of the random number generators, thank you, Glauco, all of the random number generators that you have seen are, uh, uh, that MATLAB uses and other places uses are a pseudo random number, uh, random number generator. Okay, could you let me share my screen here, Glauco? Yes. And one that, One that uh, I have used, in fact, I used to use it on the HP calculator. Whoops, you're seeing my dirty laundry, ignore this. Oh no, that was, that was for this class, that's okay. Was this random number generator. And I'm gonna write it down, I'm gonna ask if you've seen it before. I forgot to put something in here, the fractional part. So you take a random number in your sequence, you add pi, you raise it to the fifth power, and then you take the fractional part of it. So if x sub n plus pi, if it's equal to something like 31.6, or maybe 131.6294, then your next random number is gonna be 0 0.6294. Okay, so that becomes your new random number. And then you would take this new random number, you would feed it in here, you would run it through again, you would add pi, raise it to the fifth power and take the fractional part of it. This is called, Glauco, what's this called? It's a variation of the congruence, congru, 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 I don't know. That's easy for you to say, huh? <laughs> no. The congruent? Congruent, yeah, so, yeah. And uh, um, and this is a variation because the congruent doesn't have the the power; it has a multiplication. But yes, and this is that, kind of the same. But this turns out to be a pretty easy random number generator to crack, and people aren't using this anymore. They're using random number generators called the Merzen Twister, and I think that that's a very common 
uh, technique, but the Mersen twister is also deterministic. Notice this is deterministic, right? And like I think Adam mentioned, if you go out to the billionth place of pi and you get nine, eight, three, zero, one, you, you get a sequence of numbers, right? These numbers are deterministic in the sense that you have a very short program to generate it because there's very short programs that generate the number pi, correct? And so you should be able to get this in the billionth. But you know what? If you took this and you, you fed it to the diehard test, it would pass the test. It would pass the test. The bottom line is that there are different definitions of randomness. There are different definitions of randomness. If you take uh, the course in information theory, you'll find out, for example, that if you have sequences of this sort, that they're not random because if you run this through a zip file, this will this will compress to a very short very short program. Where if you flip a coin, okay, that's supposed to be a coin flip. This will be random, and this file will not compress right? So this file, according to algorithmic information theory, is, is random, whereas this file is not random. It's not as random. So it's the degree of compression in algorithmic information theory that defines randomness. There is, to my knowledge, only one true source of random number generator, generators, and that is through, and I think we mentioned this at the beginning of the lectures also. This is the uh, random number generators specified by quantum collapse. And this is something that Penrose points out in his book also, that true randomness occurs with quantum co collapse. Before you know the wave function, then boom, it collapses to a specific number when the, when the state is observed. And a sequence of those numbers is truly random and uh, will not only pass the diehard test, but I talked to a guy. In fact, it was, um, oh gosh, one of our professors, Professor um, Blair, Enrique Blair had his advisor come out and give a talk and say that he had, he had generated a number of these zeros and ones, if you will, from a quantum random number generator, and that they were not compressible. They were not compressible. You couldn't compress them at all. So this is another thing we have to remember, that um, that randomness is ha has different, different interpretations, one of which, in a practical sense, is the diehard test. A more theoretical one is in this compression test. And we use random number generators, which are deterministic all the time. But we can say that this generates true random numbers. How can we ever say that this is true random numbers? By the choice of the seed. In other words, this is what I had to do. And what is interesting is that the seed in an algorithm, if you're doing it purely random, you must reach outside of the algorithm of the computer program in order to get the seed. Sometimes they look at the clock of the computer and they, they grab the first or, or the last few significant digits or bits of the clock. You've all seen clocks go by, right? And, and the hour hands go really slow. The minute hands, the minute hands come faster. The second hands, then you have the, uh, the, the, the tenths of a second and the milliseconds. And out here, the nanoseconds. And the nanoseconds pass so quickly that they're blurred, right? 
So imagine taking a nanosecond, 10 nanoseconds, and 100 nanoseconds, taking those three digits, just whoop, grabbing it as fast as you can as they're going by being blurred. That many times is used as a seed. But here's something interesting. A computer program itself can never generate a random number. That the random number is deterministic and most of the most of the random number generators which are being used, which are the ones that you used in the Monte Carlo pr problems, are indeed deterministic. But what makes them stochastic is the initial seed. And then that makes the whole sequence stochastic in some sense. So I find that fascinating that algorithms and computer programs are unable to generate randomness by themselves. And in order to get the seed, you must go external to the program. Like in the MATLAB, you can put in your seed. You can tell it what you would like for the seed. And then it goes ahead from there. But notice that's again, external to the program. Really fascinating stuff. Okay, let's see. We still have uh, we still have about ten minutes left. Any questions on 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 the home? Oh, are we done with the homework? I don't think we are. No, we're I think not. We've only done the first problem. Yeah, we've only done the first problem. Okay, uh, this one we've already talked about. Now the, uh, that this was bad, and if I ask this again, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask for ten dollars. Okay, because I think uh, somebody using using uh, Wolfram Alpha came out with one minus 10 to the 40th. Is that, I think that was Glauco, is that to right? The, to the 400th. To the 400th power. But it's very interesting because uh, I will expect that uh, it will be probable to have like 100 or something like that. I, I do too. But it's so, I have, I can show the, the graph if you want. Sure, um, so let's do that. The, let, me, uh, let me stop, yeah. okay. You're sharing. Let me let me scroll to the bottom of the. Yeah, here it is the 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 Gaussian distribution. That's for, a Gaussian. Yeah. So you get something around five hundred, maybe four seventy five. It's very sharp. I mean, it's yeah, it's sharper sharp. than, than I expected. So the, the so so go back to the graph. I want a good number. How about five? Uh, oh, do you want me to change it? No, ten, ten. I'm trying to see what I should put in my question, not over a hundred, but over a watt. What's a, what's a small value? Oh, I can open MATLAB and try with different values. Okay, no, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just gonna use, uh, I'm just gonna use 10. It looks like 10 would be in the ballpark. Yeah. Okay, but thank 10, you. 10, 10 be like 0. 0.1 times 10 to the negative 40th as well. Oh, is that right? Wouldn't oh you, my wouldn't gosh. Wouldn't you want to do something yeah, farther along like 470 or something like that? Yeah. Yeah, you need a bigger number, not a smaller. Yeah. Oh, you're right. Looking you're at right. That plot. So what, what's the average? No, you're exactly right. The average is 500. The average is 500. No, the average is 495, exactly. And uh, the, I think. Well, if the mean is 500, maybe. Yeah, the mean should be the mean, average yeah. is. Uh, yeah, no, but you, you, only have, you only have errors from zero to, to 099. You cannot have an error of one. So the average is a little, the mean is a little bit lower. Interesting stuff. Oh. Okay. So and four then, 495, yes. And this is the, the standard deviation. And this is what I did with Wolfram Alpha because MATLAB will tell me that it was one. See this earth C by the way, uh, generates one minus. So this is, um, okay, so that's good. That's the complement of the earth. That's the earth on the tails. Yeah. So that's what earth complement is. It's the earth uh, on the tails. Usually the earth is defined over the meat of the Gaussian. The earth complement is defined over the tails. Okay, go ahead. Um, no, that's all. Okay. I, I, I have the I have it in in MATLAB. I can try to put different numbers and. Okay, no, that's fine. I, I think what I'm going to do is estimate the total probability of the error is greater than 495 next time. Uh, I tell you, that was that was a careless, a careless problem on my on my part. So. 
Okay. Um, the second one, greater than $1,000. I hope everybody got that one. Uh, one of the thoughts is that you should apply the Gaussian here. But we must remember that the model is only a Gaussian. And if we only have $1,000 that are rounded up, the most we can get is $1,000. So the probability absolutely is not one minus 10 to the thousand to the minus thousandth or something like that. It is, um, it is one. No, it is zero. I'm sorry, it's zero. There's actually zero probability that you could do that. And I hope you all saw that. Okay. Um, okay, let's go, let's go to this one. Uh, computer work. Okay. Uh, anybody want to share this one? And were you surprised at the result? I remember the first time I saw it, I was surprised at the result. Okay, Theo, go for it. Let me okay. quit sharing here. Here we go. Uh, so I kind of wanted for my Gaussian to be a, a, a little bit noisy. Like it, it very quickly converged to uh, graphically indistinguishable Gaussian. So I chose three probability density functions. Each of them have 32 uh, elements because we're kind of doing this in a discrete fashion. Um, and then I chose each of my, my probability density functions to be a completely random density function. And then I normalized them uh, at the beginning. So I think because I normalized them at the beginning, if I add up all of the elements inside of the convolved density function, I get a one. And then if I plot, uh, I, I plotted in blue the convolution of those three random density functions. And then in orange, I used the fit uh, tool to fit a Gaussian to that and plot okay. it out of it. Okay, yeah, that works. Were you astonished at this? I was surprised at how quickly it how quickly like the central limit theorem works, and we you must realize that Theo used a a density function that was just random, mm -hmm. uh, just a bunch of random numbers, and then then he he scaled it to one, and then um, convolved the three and got this. Anybody else astonished and want to share? Very good. Nobody else wants to share. Did you all get similar sort of results? Okay. Uh, my hope is that you were a little bit astonished at, at the result that just convolving a few of these things gave a Gaussian and just the strength and the power of the central limit theorem. We know that it approaches it asymptotically, but you've seen now empirically that at least in many, many cases, it doesn't take a lot to approach a Gaussian. And this is the reason people in social sciences always use a Gaussian. Because they have, they're they're adding up a bunch of numbers. They're adding up a bunch of numbers which come from the same distribution. So they add them up, and what is that? Well, by the central limit theorem, that's a Gaussian. What if you take that number and you divide by n to get the average? That's still a Gaussian. So that's the reason the Gaussians are so so incredibly powerful in statistics. Unfortunately, they're overused and sometimes abused, or sometimes where the people in the social sciences use uh, this Gaussian assumption where it isn't uh, applicable. I'll give you an example. I think we mentioned the Black-Scholes equation was derived using that stochastic differential equation that I gave you previously. In order to work it out, they had to assume that the measure of the, that the movement of the stock market was Gaussian. However, if one looks empirically at the movement of the stock market, it is not a Gaussian. It is a curve that is bell-shaped, but it has much fatter curves. But you can't work it out in closed form if you have fatter, fatter, uh, fatter tails. So Gaussian is assumed all over the place, but it always isn't applicable. Okay, guys, I hope, I hope this was fun for you. It was uh, enjoyable to go through this and hopefully through some of these computer simulations, you got a better feel for what was going on with the central limit theorem with the law of large numbers, et cetera, and, and saw that it, it works. It's, and it works amazingly. 
And uh, so that's kind of cool. Okay, I think we're out of time. Any final questions before we go? Okay, everybody's shaking their heads no. We've had too much fun. Okay, we will see you all. Be of good cheer.